Okay, it is 3 o'clock, so out of respect for everyone's time, we'll go ahead and we'll get started with today's webinar um, presented by Bank First and Ansane Associates. Today we're going to be covering a very important topic, which is protecting your business from fraud. My name is Deb Weicker, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Before we get started, let's go over a few housekeeping items. First, if you are having audio issues, um, obviously you won't be able to hear this, but you can see this on the screen. Uh, there is a call-in number listed right here. Uh, for some attendees, it tends to work better by dialing in with a phone versus using the speaker over your computer. Next, all attendees will be muted during the webinar. However, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the questions panel, which is typically located on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we will be pausing throughout the webinar to read and answer your questions. And finally, this webinar is being recorded, and a link of this recording will be emailed to you following the webinar. You may also find a link to the, recorded, to the recording on the Bank First or ANSA and Associates website. Allow me to introduce you today's presenters. First, we have Jessica Darmawan, Senior Vice President of Treasury Management at Bank First. Jessica will be sharing examples of common fraud activities businesses are currently experiencing, as well as informing you of tools you can use to help protect your business. Next, Jason Hogue, Com Commercial Insurance Advisor at Ansane Associates, will share information about cyber risk and how to identify those items most at risk at your business. And finally, Alan Edwards, Claims Advocate Manager at Ansane Associates, will cover some fraud claim scenarios and coverage options your business may want to consider. So let's go ahead, we'll get started. Jessica, I will give uh, the screen control to you. Okay, very good, thank you, Deb. Hello, everybody. Like Deb said, I'm Jessica Darmwan. I'm the Senior Vice President of Treasury Management at Bank First. Uh, thank you for taking your time on this busy day to listen to our presentation on the very important topic of fraud. Uh, there's many different ways businesses need to think about fraud um, to make sure that totally overall they're protected. Um, but today I'm going to just primary, primarily focus on payments fraud prevention. Um, so payments fraud, as you see here, um, has drastically increased throughout the last five years. Um, we see it in the numbers, as you see 81 financial professionals or businesses reported that their organization experienced an attempt and or an actual fraud um, in 2019. We don't have the 2020 numbers just quite yet, uh, but they will be out uh, sometime shortly. Um, but that's up, you know, from 62% in 2014. So, um, you know, we see it in the numbers and we see it nearly every day at Bank First. Um, fraudsters are getting smarter and they know when to strike. Um, we just came off the holiday season and, you know, that is prime time fraud season. These fraudsters know that, you know, a lot of people during that time are on vacation. They know that the backup to the backup is the only one in the office on Christmas Eve and New Year's Day when, uh, New Year's Eve when um, the banks are open and um, they know that that's a prime time to strike. So that's why we have here, you know, it's not if fraud will occur to my business, it's when. So what type of uh, payments fraud am I talking about? I'm gonna take it to the next slide here. Okay, so payments fraud that I'm talking about, uh, checks, wire transfers, ACH debits, corporate commercial credit cards, and ACH credit. So you see the percentages there. Um, and then the sources of attempted um, fraud, outside individuals, business email compromise, and third-party outsource, outsourcers. So um, we're going to go into each one of these um, individually, get a little bit more information on it, and then some tools um, that could help your business um, prevent, uh, prevent any losses due to this type of fraud.
Uh, check fraud is the first one that we are going to talk about. And you might say, wait a sec here, um, I thought checks were going away. Well, so did everybody in the, in the payments industry. Um, but checks still, 42% um, of businesses still use checks as accounts payable. Um, so basically, between the large number of checks that are still out there and the large number of accounts that are out there, um, business owners basically need to know that it's very important to, you know, keep their accounts safe um, against check fraud. We um, at Bank First have seen checks up into even the highest I've seen is $175,000. It was a check that, that cleared a customer's account and it was fraudulent. And um, the customer had a sweep account and uh, the check went unnoticed. And, you know, when it comes to fraud, you got to keep in mind the 24 hour rule as far as you have 24 hours to notify your financial institution of, of a fraudulent um, check. So um, they were, you know, not in the time frame of informing us. And unfortunately, uh, that customer suffered a loss. So we really need to stress the importance of being religious about um, either using some sort of uh, fraud tools and or uh, making sure that your accounts are looked at daily. So go to the next slide. Okay, so some of these um, preventions against uh, check fraud, uh, check positive pay is, is very, very important um, for business customers. Um, this, as you see in the slide, between July and December has saved our customers uh, $56,000 in, in fraud, fraud attempts. And um, so check positive pay, basically it, it involves a little bit of work on your end, but uh, you issue your bank a issued file and or you manually enter in each account payable check that you write, the check number, dollar amount, and who it's made payable to. And as those checks clear, um, it matches up against that information. And uh, if there's an exception to that, you're notified and you're able to look at that check to see if it's, if it's truly fraudulent or not and staying in the 24 hour time frame of getting that check returned. Um, another protective measure you can do is reduce the amount of checks uh, that are issued. Um, we have a lot of businesses at Bank First that are completely paperless, and um, that's great. I know, you know, obviously the numbers say that 42% of the payments are still checks, so there's a lot of a lot of checks still out in the system. But um, if you can reduce the amount of checks that you write and maybe do more ACH payments, uh, that could help with with checks. Uh, there's a statistic out there that um, each check is touched by at least an average of seven people throughout its, its life cycle. So if you think about that, you know, on your check, what is it? It's your account number and it's your routing number. And, you know, fraudsters are really good at taking that information, creating fake checks and or um, using that information fraudulently. So um, to get that out of the system, um, if you could just not use checks, that would be a good thing. Um, segregation of accounts. Um, obviously, if you um, have a, a payroll account and all there is to it is you're writing out uh, payroll checks, uh, you could have that as a separate account. So if something were to come through that was fraudulent, you would hope that maybe it would be a dollar amount that then overdraws the account and then that would set up the red flag right there that uh, we would be able to look at it and get the the uh, check returned and or daily reconciliation. And that's going to be pretty much the, the key factor on all of these um, on all of these methods as far as just making sure that you're looking at if if this is a method you're using, you're looking at not only the check, but you're opening it up. You're looking at, you know, is the check number correct? Is the dollar amount correct? And is the payee still correct? Did somebody, you know, just make sure that they didn't wash whoever you intended to pay off of that check and now is uh, made payable to somebody else? So those are some measures against check fraud. Next slide. Um, Wire fraud is also um, very, very prevalent still. And um, one, uh, one of the methods that's out there is business email compromise, right? So the definition of business email compromise is out there. We've all heard about business email compromise, um, but in the description, you can see that it's a sophisticated scam. And it just is that just because 
Um, you know, how many times do we, you know, tell our employees or do we know not to trust emails? But for some reason or another, um, these fraudsters are so good and they craft these emails so well that people fall for it time and time again. So you'll see here that they target, you know, um, account payable areas, human resources. Um, but the next slide is, you know, all the different types of, you know, business business email compromises that are out there. And um, it's always, you know, an urgency to get that money out as soon as possible. And unfortunately, when it comes to wires, um, once you hit that send button, you're not getting that money back. Um, so when it comes to business email compromise, the things that you can do to protect your bank account, again, is just educating your employees, educating anybody who, you know, would send out wires um, and or answer to emails at your, at your business. Implement policies and procedures that no email can be trusted, right? So make sure that uh, if you do get an email with someone that you typically pay via wire and they say, my account information has now changed, you make sure to call that customer back but not using the the phone number that's on the email that they're requesting a change on. Um, and just put that in your internal procedures and policies. Um, and then another thing is dual control as far as if you um, initiate a wire, have somebody else approve it at your financial institution. And if you're a business owner, I would want you know, to be that approver um, just to make sure that uh, you know what's you know leaving your bank account because again these wires um, they're they're high dollar amount and uh, you want to make sure you know you know what's being paid out via wire. So there's other things on that slide, but those are the the, the ones that I'm going to highlight anyways. Um, next form of payment fraud is ACH debit. So again, they're, the fraudsters, they can get your account information in many different ways. One that we talked about is just right off of your checks. They take the account number and the routing number and they go to eBay and they purchase something and it comes through via ACH debit and um, it's unauthorized. And or, um, of course, you know, business email compromise is kind of the same as, um, as check fraud. Um, so again, once anybody were to get your information and they send an ACH debit to debit your account, you have 24 hours to let bank first or your bank know that it's unauthorized. Um, so some of the protective measures that you can put in place to help uh, fight against ACH debit fraud is ACH filters. Um, this is a great tool uh, that it's easy, it's a set it and forget it. You know, you tell uh, the, the bank, this is who I authorize to debit my account via ACH at this dollar amount. And if something comes in over that, that um, amount and or not on your list, you get emailed and you get notified again. So then you can act upon it in the time frame allowed to ensure that you're not going to suffer any losses from that fraud. Um, you'll see here, uh, Bank First, between July and December, it's $25,000 in um, ACH debit fraud that we saved our customers. And um, again, reconcile your accounts daily. Um, it has to be daily because the time frame only allows for 24 hours. And then also, if you do have accounts that shouldn't receive any ACHs, debits at all, you can put a block on it so nothing even comes through. It just gets, it comes to the bank and there's a block and it gets returned back and um, you don't suffer any losses. Okay. Um, next, ACH credit fraud, um, kind of the same thing as, as email or as wires again, um, but when it comes to ACH credit fraud, another way that, uh, you know, the fraudsters can get your information is corporate account takeover, where, you know, they would get your username and password, they would log into your system, and they would be able to send money out of your account uh, via ACH. So, um, you know, this definitely brings up a more of an IT element to, you know, making sure that uh, your systems and everything is secure. Um, but, you know, Bank First, you know, if you do have access to our, like, ACH platform and or wire platform, we have, you know, security tokens that you need to log, that you use to log in. So there's more, um, you know, multi-factor, more security that uh, is used to make sure that, uh, you know, the fraudsters don't get your, get into your systems. Um, 
But then other protective measures really, again, you know, educate your employees. I'm trying to go to the next slide here. Yeah, make sure that you have, um, you know, disaster recovery plans um, with strong controls. Uh, restrict your, your corporate network access to, you know, company issued devices only. You know, you only log into your banking platforms on those devices. Um, and then just make sure if, if you do have a separate PC, you know, with no with no emails, you know, that's the PC that you use for your for your banking. Um, that's separate from any any other things that employees could do on those PCs. Uh, the last time of type of payment fraud, uh, just credit cards. You can see all the different type of, of frauds, uh, fraud ways that credit cards can be frauded there. And um, you know, just know again, um, if you have employees that have uh, corporate credit cards, uh, you can restrict, you know, by MCC codes where they spend. Uh, their, where they can use their cards. If you want them to only use their cards at gas stations, you can restrict it that way. And so they can't just go on to any website and, and you purchase things with your corporate credit cards. Again, monitor your activity daily and uh, contact your credit card provider immediately if you see something suspicious. So in conclusion, I uh, just want to let you know, obviously, you know, payments fraud, it's out there and it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, these thieves are good at what they do and they are relentless. So uh, make sure you reach out to your bank's treasury management team if, uh, if, if you would like more information and or your relationship manager at your bank um, and to discuss any fraud prevention tools. Uh, I hope you found that this information is valuable and, you know, together we want to work with you to ensure that your, your business doesn't fall, fall victim. So thank you. And uh, Deb, if you want to open up to any questions. Thank you, Jessica. I don't see any questions that have come in so far, so I think we're good. If anything were to change, I'll be sure to uh, key you in. So next we're going to uh, switch it over to Jason on cyber risk. Jason, I am going to give you uh, control, so you should be able to change the slides yourself. Thanks, Deb. Uh, Jason Hogue with Anson Associates here. I know this is going to be the most exciting portion of the presentation because it's cyber insurance. I know that's what you guys are all here for, right? Exciting, exciting stuff. Um, so Jason Hogue with Anson Associates. I've been a business insurance agent here at Anson for uh, six years, I had hold, handle a wide uh, variety of accounts from transportation, habitational to healthcare, um, and deal a lot with cyber insurance. Some with significantly great uh, cyber exposures, like my accounts in the healthcare industry and the bank software industry, and accounts with um, lesser cyber exposures, like construction accounts and stuff like that. So things have really, really uh, changed in the in the cyber insurance world over the six years that I alone have been doing it. Uh, it had really, really started off as uh, coverage for uh, identity theft, data recovery, that type of stuff. But it's it's really, really evolved into more and more of a crime coverage now. And you kind of saw some of the stuff that uh, Jessica had touched on earlier with, with the fraud stuff. But right now, cyber has evolved to include uh, on top of the uh, data theft, identity theft uh, type coverages to include um, ransomware. If your computer gets hacked, locked up, freezes up all your systems, and the hacker is demanding $50,000 to social engineering. They, they hack into your system, monitoring emails going back and forth. They send an email to the controller, pay this invoice to this ACH number, and that ACH number goes to the hacker. So it's it's really really evolved. It's a it's a changing risk, and it, it's really really shifted from when I first started in the industry. Um, so cyber risk is it's commonly defined as the exposure to harm or loss resulting from breaches or attacks on the information systems. Uh, the potential for loss or harm related to the technical technical infrastructure or use of technology within the organization. The risk can be internal or external. Uh, risk can be intentional or unintentional. So internal employees, uh, think for example, you have an employee that uh, 
print, prints out a bunch of uh, sensitive data and releases that information over the internet. Um, unintentional, uh, we didn't take down a, a security patch or a firewall wasn't properly installed. Or it could be external threats or in intentional words, uh, your systems are being hacked into. So it, it's, it's a risk that's really, really evolving. So we're going to see if this, my, I'm not, Deb, I'm not, re there we go. So what kind of exposures are we talking about? What's at risk? Uh, customer data, employee data, data of vendors, business partners, intellectual property, trade secrets, patents, copyrights, financial data, money, um, at the operational risk, reliance on technology or data to operate and perform your services and meet your service agreements. So. Um, customer data, but if you're thinking to the healthcare industry, um, one of my companies has a uh, private, it, it's a, a, a dialysis company. So they have everybody's private healthcare. So if that type of stuff got hacked. So we, when we took that program over, we did a, a full blown review. And this, this is going to kind of talk to um, cyber insurance programs and how different they are from carrier to carrier. Uh, but it, it boils down to, do we understand the risk? Do we understand the exposure? And is our policy responding properly to that exposure? So this healthcare company didn't have coverage for business interruption. So if, if you think if they get hacked and they can't do business and um, they don't have the proper cyber coverage in place, even though that the cyber program that they have, it didn't have business in interruption coverage, because there wasn't a thorough risk review reviewing what is part of the program and what isn't part of the program, uh, that type of business is going to be out of business. Now, it's going to be different on, on a construction account. A construction account isn't going to have a massive exposure. Their exposure is going to be more on the end of a, a, a social engineering where uh, a hacker hacks into their system and retrieves um, an email, monitors emails going back and forth between the CEO and the controller, and then acts as the CEO, sends the email to the controller, send the invoice payment to this company. That, that's going to be different than the business interruption. So just, you, you have to, um, the agent has to understand what type of business, understand what type of exposure, what are you guys doing, what are you using, and, and be able to tailor the cyber program to that. Because, um, the cyber program needs to be able to respond to the type of exposures that you have through your business. There's three types of risk categories within the cyber exposures. There's the informational risk, privacy liability risk, and the operational risk. The operational risk is going to be data, volumes of info that you hold on to and the cost to recover or restore that data. So another customer that was um, con construction account got hit with a ransomware attack. They hacked into their systems, locked up all their data. They're able, still able to perform their uh, duties on a normal basis. So there wasn't any sort of uh, business interruption loss where they, they were locked up and weren't able to do business. But what happened is the, the server got held for ransomware and they essentially had to rebuild their server. Now this was a customer that was a good, is a good friend, still is a good friend, um, still a customer. Uh, we met for the renewal, uh, we're going through the exposures, talking about the re, um, what they do and everything and, and how that's evolving. Uh, we quoted cyber, provided the cyber option to them and he flat out said, Jason, I don't, I don't believe that we have that exposure. I said, okay. So at that point in time, we don't add cyber to the policy. Literally eight weeks later, get a call on Thursday night at eight o'clock, Jason, I uh, remember that cyber stuff you tried to sell me. Yes, uh, I have that. I'm like, um, he's like, no, I have that. And I'm like, <laughs> no, you don't. You, you elected not to. He's like, yeah, that's kind of what I thought. But here's what happened. And they got hit by the ransomware attack where they had locked up their servers. And he ended up spending $18,000 to have their server rebuilt, all the data rebuilt. That's going to be the informational type of risk. So a privacy liability risk, um, you know, kind of talking about the um, 
bank software company that I had mentioned earlier, they're, they're gonna have the privacy liability. They have the liability of the, the customer's data, the bank's customer's data in their hand. So the, the, their job is to protect that. So massive, massive cyber exposure, very different from a construction account. And it, you need to understand what, what the risk is, where is it, and how do we protect that risk? So they're, they're carrying the business interruption coverage to provide if they get hacked and they can't provide that software support to their banks that they would still have income coming in from their cyber insurance program. And then the operational risk. We talked a little bit about it earlier with some of the business interruption coverage. So there, there's really two types of risks. And we've talked a little bit about it, but kind of laying it out, what's first party and what's third party. First party risk is going to be um, the, the ransomware claim. If he gets himself locked up, it's a direct loss incurred by the insured because of an injury to the data or, or the systems. So you're, you're looking at coverage for the cost to investigate and fix the problem. Expenses to protect consumers, including notification and credit monitoring costs. So a first party risk in that regard. So if you remember back roughly five, six years ago, Target had got hit with one of, one of, one of the major, major cyber attacks where thousands of customers' data was released. Well, Target at that time, with a cyber insurance policy, would be able to have coverage for the expenses to protect their consumers, including notifying each and every one of them um, about what happened, that they got hit with a breach, their, their data may have been released, we, but we uh, are now in the process of monitoring your credit to make sure nothing is uh, happening further on your account. Um, and then other expenses to mitigate loss, including public response and crisis costs, which obviously when Target had that happen, that's the type of stuff um, that they would have coverage for. No loss of future income and costs to regain connectivity. You know. Uh, I know my wife still keeps going back to Target, so it obviously didn't affect us, but um, the loss of future income and costs to regain connectivity. Um, and cyber extortion would be another one of those uh, first party risks, kind of talking about some of the ransomware stuff that we had talked about earlier. Uh, third party risk, liability from financial losses or costs sustained by others resulting from the insured's uh, wrongful acts, defense expenses, damages resulting from consumer suits and suits from others, for personal content injury, pain and suffering, emotional damages, intellectual property claims, professional services, and other injury from uh, security or privacy breach and regulatory fines and penalties. I'm gonna turn it over to Al, our claims advocate here at ANSE. Uh, he's gonna do a great job talking about some cyber claim scenarios for you. I think I am now unmuted. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Al Edwards. As Jason mentioned, um, my title at ANSI is Claims Advocate Manager. My role involves working with uh, folks like Jason, uh, producers and the service teams and helping our clients work through claims issues, um, working on claims management um, and claims oversight and some complex and larger claims. Uh, particularly with our commercial accounts. And so that dovetails nicely into our discussion today because uh, the commercial accounts that Jason and the other agents and I work on, um, you know, we've seen, Jason's mentioned some um, claim stories already, but we wanted to start, my portion of the discussion today is really to talk, we've talked about, you know, payment fraud, banking fraud. Jason talked about some of the cyber risks that you should be concerned about. Now, my role is going to talk a little bit about cyber claim situations and um, cyber insurance coverage. So, um, obviously, transferring the risk, the cyber risk that Jason talked about to insurance is um, beneficial to most businesses. And I would argue maybe almost all businesses is to get some sort of insurance backing for these cyber risks that Jason talked about. So I'll start my portion of the presentation talking about a few cyber, cyber claim scenarios. I think it's helpful when, to get into what does cyber insurance 
provide coverage for? Well, what are some of the situations that might trigger the cyber insurance? Uh, someone maliciously destroying your data. Um, Jason has already mentioned the hackers, um, the hackers launching a denial of service attack against you, basically holding your data hostage. Um, the virus, we've heard about viruses, malware, spyware for quite some time. Um, if a virus gets into your system, clearly that can create um, cyber problems and exposures. Jason just had a good example of how you have to, you know, get a client who had to have their server rebuilt. An employee accidentally destroying a database. Um, employee actions, Jason mentioned, unintentional as it may be, could still create a cyber problem. Uh, power surge wiping out your business uh, server. Um, a rogue employee copying company files, records, and emails. Um, maybe before or, you know, as a part of the termination process sometimes. And we've talked about the term ransomware, that's a very popular trend right now. Um, somebody holding your computer data for, for ransom. I'm gonna go through a claim example in a little bit that'll kind of give you a, a real life application of what we mean by ransomware and what insurance coverage is available for those kind of incidents. So with that, I'll move on to our next slide. I hope. There we go. Uh oh. <laughs> so the next slide talks. I'm jumping around here. Okay, that's the slide I need to be on. We'll hope it stays. Sorry about that. So cyber insurance coverages. Uh, we talked already about first party risks and third party risks. And I think it is helpful to kind of keep that format when we talk about what coverages does a cyber insurance policy typically provide. Um, as Jason mentioned, that's a tough question to answer because cyber coverages, unlike some traditional coverages like auto, property, you know, it's a new and evolving arena of insurance. And that means that when we say that this is what cyber insurance coverage is, we have to qualify it that many forms, it's kind of buyers be, buyer beware. Some forms cover things that others don't. And so you have to really kind of be sure of what kind of insurance you're, you're, you're purchasing. But generally speaking, um, cyber insurance on the first party side covers for monetary losses um, that an insured has as a result of a cyber incident or data breach. A very, um, I think, very important one is IT consulting costs. If you think of many small to medium-sized businesses, they don't have a huge IT staff just waiting for a cyber problem to evolve. And so that needs to be outsourced. And whenever you outsource, we all know that comes at a significant expense. So the cyber coverage, I think one of the big advantages of having the coverage is they will actually bring in IT consulting services to help identify the problem, mitigate the problem, um, determine you know, the extent of the problem, the scope of the problem, and resolve the problem. Um, the cyber insurance can pay for, on the first party side, notifications and credit monitoring costs. Um, when businesses hold data of their customers, for example, um, and that gets released, whether it's through their, you know, their doing or not, um, they have some legal obligations to those customers or consumers to notify them. And in some cases to help monitor their credit if some of their financial um, information is at risk. It can pay um, public relations, media or crisis costs, um, can reimburse for money lost when an employee is tricked into sending money to someone else. Uh, lost profits, downtime is a huge uh, coverage that is important, including overtime expenses. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Dependent business coverage. So if your business is dependent on, um, let's say another business holds your data and that data was put at risk, that could affect, cause a downtime for your business. So you have to look at, there can be coverage for dependent business situations such as that. 
and a big one right now because this is the, the trend in cyber um, security issues is pays the ransom. Most of these coverages will actually pay the ransom and I'll talk about an example of a situation we had here at our agency uh, in which a very large ransom payment was needed to get the customer back up and running. And usually that's to unlock data files that are being encrypted by the threat actor causing the problem. So then we get into this slide talks about third party coverage. Well, these are okay. The first party covers your damages as a business owner, but what about other folks who uh, data, data may have been compromised because of a cyber incident involving your business? Well, a big expense that third party coverage would pay for is the investigation expenses, the scope of the problem. We talked about that a little bit already. Credit monitoring, legal expenses involved in answering a suit or handling a claim, settling the customer's suit. And another big one is paying for regulatory fines or penalties that government entities may impose upon the business. So this is the scenario I had for you that we actually experienced I worked on this over the past year with one of our commercial producers here at ANSE. Um, I called it IT kidnapping. It's a classic ransomware attack. But one thing that Jason kind of alluded to already, this can happen to businesses big and, big and small. Um, in this particular case, um, computers or the attacker hacked into the system, put some files on our client's server and encrypted all the files they needed to basically run their business. What was kind of unique about this scenario though, is they not only encrypted our, our clients' data files, but they actually were able to reach out to some of our clients' customers um, through a similar process, but extend the encryption and put those encrypted files even on our, our clients' customers' servers and systems. So now you had a situation where a cyber attack was causing a business downtime issue for our client, but also customers of our client that were relying on that data to operate. So there's where you get the first party problem and you get the third party problem all in the same claim. So in this particular incident, incident um, what claims were made by our client Acme Computers in our hypothetical here. Well, as I mentioned, very large expenses in hiring IT consultants. They came in to investigate the encryption, protect against any further attacks. They helped our client identify what customers were actually impacted and also monitor their network for any other activity that might threaten their, their data. Another claim that was made by Acme is business interruption. Their business was shut down for a period of time. And there were a couple uh, customers that they simply lost because of the incident. And along with business income typically comes extra expense coverage. Uh, they had a lot of overtime. Uh, they were interestingly in the computer service business. They were a computer networking company. So they had to pull their employees off of their typical job duties and pay extensive overtime to work with the IT consultants to get their business up and running. And the big one is they made a claim for help with the ransom. Um, any of the ransom, the related expenses dealing with, um, you know, because the threat actor was clearly holding the data hostage um, and wanted in exchange as typical as a ransom the money. So the carrier in this case stepped in and believe it or not, I always, when I got involved, I found this quite astonishing. They paid the threat actor um, $250,000 in ransom to release the encryption key and let our client resume their operations. Um, they settled 13 customer claims. Those are the third party claims because customers, uh, businesses were shut down because their data the threat actor pierced our client's uh, network, but also some of their customers. Um, paid extensive business income and extra expenses of our client. And again, provided significant IT consulting services that were really invaluable to our client. So I think this was kind of an interesting um, 
claim scenario that kind of highlights a lot of the risks and a lot of the coverages that we've talked about up till now. So this is kind of a buyer beware point in our discussion because um, what I've found when we get into some of these cyber incidents, um, what is cyber insurance? We've talked a lot about that today, but what is it not? And one thing it's not is direct coverage for theft of money and securities, which is also often woven into these incidents. Um, and by buyer beware, I mean, as a business owner, you wanna be sure you have your crime coverage in place. That's separate coverage for theft of money and securities um, that needs to be purchased as part of your property insurance program. Oftentimes, cyber insurance isn't true employee dishonesty coverage. As a business owner, you always want to look at to have adequate employee dishonesty coverage and that otherwise known as fidelity coverage kicks in when your employees cause a theft of money. Um, and there could be a question when you have a cyber claim, is that the employee dishonesty coverage or is that the cyber coverage? One thing to keep in mind is cyber insurance is not hardware coverage. Um, it's not coverage for physical damage to your computer equipment um, or an actual physical loss to your server. Uh, certainly may cover some of the expenses to rebuild the data or recover the software that's on that computer hardware, but the actual physical damage to the hardware servers would be covered in a property policy. It may not cover senior executive level acts. Oftentimes buried in these forms are um, exclusions. They'll cover employees, but if you get to be a certain senior executive level in the company, you would not have coverage. So you gotta be aware of that. May not cover reputational harm to your business. Clearly a tough thing to quantify, and there may be exclusions for that that you have to be aware of. Loss of intellectual property, things like patents, trade secrets. So the actual value of those to the business may not be covered under your cyber form. Could be covered, should be covered elsewhere in your, your insurance package, but probably not on the cyber front. And the last bullet is just talking about loss of future profits and revenue. Typically, cyber insurance is gonna pay your downtime from the time of the incident to the time that the insurance company deems the incident restore, is restored or you've recovered from the incident. But as business owners, you probably know a lot of the expenses and the loss of revenue can trickle well beyond that. So sometimes you'll wanna be sure you're working with your agent to be sure you've got coverage for future profits and revenue that may occur after the period of restoration is deemed complete by the insurance company. So lastly, we wanted to just mention that the other big advantage to considering cyber insurance for your business is not so much a response to an actual loss, a cyber incident, but can help you with things and some risk management services before an incident or without an incident even happening. Online learning centers, oftentimes they'll give you, the insurance coverage gives you access to a web portal that has a variety of resources designed for training your employees um, on cyber exposures and how to avoid them, best practice tips, things of that nature. Um, help to do your own internal risk assessment as a business, legal consultation, uh, simulated breach scenarios that you could use as training with your staff, um, help with your business continuity plans surrounding cyber, um, and some um, oftentimes they'll include like a, on the bottom there's a breach coach or breach reporting. Um, you can contact this company to just troubleshoot a problem you have. Is this really a cyber uh, claim situation or do you need some other sort of help dealing with um, the IT issues involved? So I think it's important to remember that um, sometimes uh, within your insurance covers, there's some of these services that could be very valuable to a business owner. So with that, I think there's one more slide. Um, Jason and I will wrap up our section of the cyber fraud and insurance section. The key things we'd like you to kind of take away from the presentation. And remember the risks that Jason talked about exist not only for your data, 
but also the data that you may hold of customers or other vendors or other business partners. And you have liabilities to control the uh, storage of that data. And if there is a breach, you may be liable for some of the notification and damages surrounding that. Um, cyber risks are pervasive. As Jason mentioned, they're evolving. We've seen with the pandemic, uh, additional reliance on cloud computing, work from home, that all just creates more potential risks, cyber risks and avenues for these threat actors to um, potentially get access to your data. And the risks affect all business sizes and sectors. Jason and I both gave you a couple of claim examples, but a good example I have of that is we had a small trucking account. Um, very small, I think they had maybe 11 or 12 trucks in their fleet, but they had a cyber attack and the threat actor came in, again, a ransomware, but they, being in a trucking, obviously the logistics, they locked down all their logistics data, so they couldn't even determine where they're gonna pick up loads, where they're gonna deliver loads, what drivers they had available. And even though it was a very tiny business in the scheme of the business sizes, it really shut them down and created a lot of problems and thank goodness they did have the coverage to step in and get them back up and running. Um, as we mentioned, typical coverages you'll find are the IT consulting expenses, business interruption. We've talked about both liability claims and some of the breach require, uh, recovery expenses. Um, must ensure if you're going to buy cyber insurance that both those first party and third party risks that Jason talked about are covered in your policy. And we've talked about how it's an evolving area. Um, Jason and I put together a couple of reference materials for you that may be helpful, a cyber checklist. Um, it's a tool that you can use to determine what your risks are and be sure you have the adequate, you thought through all the avenues of coverage you might need to consider. And um, I've always found there's so much unique terminology when you start talking cyber and all the IT. Um, I just learned the term electronic vandalism, which I found very, I'm very impressed that now I know that term, but um, I found that and you're always hearing different terms. Um, and I think it is helpful to have a guide sometimes if ever you're dealing with an issue. So we put together a brief terminology guide, uh, some insurance, cyber insurance terms and some cyber security terms that may help if you have an issue, put it into perspective. So that's the material that we had and um, I'll throw it back to, Jessica, no, who's wrapping us up? This Debbie? is Deb, thank you guys. Sorry, I, um, I think you did an excellent job covering everything. We have no questions in the queue, so I think yeah, we covered all the bases here when it comes to the bank tools and risks that you have there and, and the tools that you can use as well as all the insurance questions um, you may have. So um, just a reminder to everyone that you will be receiving an email with a link to the recorded webinar and also, they will be on our websites as well. Um, oh, we do have one question come in here. Do you want to read it off them? Yes. So the question is, how do you deal with workers from home? I wonder if, is this, is this, I wonder if this is an insurance question. I'm not sure. Joanna, we're going to have to, we'll follow up with you um, specifically to kind of get more details on your question. Um, when you do receive uh, the email of the recording, uh, the link to the recording, you'll also have a link to a short survey. So, of course, we appreciate your feedback. We encourage you to, to complete that survey. You'll be entered to, for a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card, and that winner will be um, chosen and um, notified next week. So, we feel that what we can do best is educate you educate you as much as we can on the topic of fraud and cybersecurity security so you're able to protect yourself and your business. So with that, thank you and have a great day.